Welcome everyone. I'm really excited that you're here for the first event in 2021 Open Studios. We have Maria de los Angeles here with us and Nathaniel Donnett. Maria graduated from the School of Art in 2015 from the painting department and now Nathaniel's here and graduated this year in 2021 from painting. So I'm just gonna share my screen here. I thought it was a really nice pairing of Maria's work beside Nathaniel's work, both in the public space, both really rich in color and material and gesture. And so that's kind of what I want today to be about, sort of unpacking where your work and practices connect with one another across the lines of public space. So Maria de los Angeles is a multi multidisciplinary artist who addresses ideas of migration, belonging, identity through her drawing, painting, printmaking, and wearable art. Um, she's been an artist in residence at Mass Mocha, El Museo de Berrio in New York, and LACMA, as well as Man of Contemporary. Um, recent solo shows and exhibitions kind of throughout her work really engages um, multiple communities through wearable art, through participatory works, and interventions in the public space. Nathaniel Donnett is from Houston, Texas, and he's a cultural practitioner whose practices occupy both metaphysical and phenomenological spaces. He applies various strategies by cultivating his over inverting polyrhythms into the poetics of everyday life. His work challenges and collapses traditional modes of linear timeline narratives through the use of radical fractal theory. With lack aesthetic tradition, notions of incompleteness and genetics. Cutting across various disciplines such as drawing, painting, sculpture, installation, public art, photography, video, and performance, Donnett questions the ideas of aesthetics and art by recontextualizing material, meaning, and treatment. So I love the kind of like materially dense work that Nathaniel creates, the kind of experiential nature of his installations and in kind of formal gallery spaces, but I'm really excited that he's here today to talk about. Uh, the work that kind of goes beyond uh, what we consider the white studio. So I want to start with Maria's project and kind of um, advocacy organizing group called We Make America. Uh, we Make America was titled as kind of a callback to Trump's slogan, Make America Great Again, and the group started in 2016. has about 200 members um, from across uh, 3,000 of just over 3,000 members, excuse me, uh, from across the country in its Facebook group. So Maria, tell me about, tell me a little bit about this project. Do you have plans to continue it in the Biden era? Um, well, the, um, the project started because we were really upset, including myself as, um, you know, formerly undocumented person. I was like really concerned with Trump's rhetoric and, um, and all of that. So we got together, many people, and some of the people might be here in the audience, and had a, went to a place and kind of met in the city and, and talked about um, using art as a way to, and many people do this, you know, um, use art as a way to kind of activate conversations and for social justice. So that is how it started. And there were like people there who were my faculty at Pratt, um, and then just, just lots of artists from the community. Uh, one of the main people is Joyce Kosloff, who is a force of nature and has done um, part of the practice of her work is also just participating in, in lots of movements and also lots of moments in history where during her lifetime that have to be activated, that we have to be part of it. And I feel like that um, since, you know, I learned a lot from being in the group and being in that first meeting and, and working and coming up with the, the name and um, through other actions that happen after the forming of this kind of organic group anybody can be part of it and anybody can propose an action or uh, a protest or making of anything so it's it's really sort of open and um i think we all sort of enjoy a change in presidency but i think that um we see so many struggles going on and my personal brainstorming right now also and with the group is also this conversation of um the border and um, and also just immigration. I've been in this country since um, age 11 or almost 12, so the early 2000s, so over 20 years. And I have seen politicians promise left and right 
that there will be comprehensive immigration reform. And when DACA was um, as a kind of solution to the fact that we didn't pass um, DREAM Act, um, we didn't pass DAPA, which was for parents, um, to protect parents from being deported and families being torn apart. And so it's just been a, a series of disappointments and broken promises um, that have happened all this time. And we also see attacks on, on people left and right, women, women's rights, reproduction rights, um, people being shot. Like we just, we live in a time where we, the environment being destroyed by corporations where we have to stand up. And so there's just a lot. And I, um, it was a really, it's been really good because it actually just takes work. And there's a lot that goes beyond behind like organizing, getting paints, getting permission, getting walls. Um, it's just been wonderful to collaborate with people with lots of different artists and non-artists too, um, and, and do do actions. So for those who might not know, Maria is herself a DACA recipient and she kind of is very outspoken uh, about the importance of that legislation, its significance. How has kind of being that public advocate for DACA changed or affected the nature of your practice? Uh, well, first of all, um, when I was a student at Yale University, I had just gotten my DACA permit, which gave me a work authorization. Um, so I was able to work in the print shop at, at Yale. And that was my first time that I was able to acquire a student employment. And it made a big difference and allowed me to uh, get to know like Marie Lorenz and a really wonderful Didier Williams. So it's like, you know, I, being able to have a job and not just be under the table um, and be part of the university and, and, and not be in the shadows um, really helped many of us emotionally, uh, psychologically and physically to be able to earn a living. Um, and then I was able to apply for advanced parole, which is crazy that it's called advanced parole, but um, it's a permit that lets you travel abroad for a reason. So I went to, I went to uh, Italy with the Pratt and Venice program uh, for like a month. And I was able to get a re-entry stamp. Um, and that was a very formidable um, moment because I felt really happy to be outside of the country for the first time. And the only way that I could get that permit was to have something substantial. Hence why I didn't go to Mexico. Uh, I didn't have any connections in Mexico. And I went to Italy with the Pratt and Venice program. Um, when I came back, I felt this kind of weight. When I came back to the airport, um, it was this kind of pressure. It was like I was going back into the pressure cooker. Um, so I think that that can be a good metaphor for what we are going through. There is a type of lightning effect that has happened with um, being able to have a work authorization, being able to be more open about our conversations, um, but that there is still um, thousands and thousands of people, uh, millions of people who don't have um, a status. And that that is just continuing exploitation because we, you know, are, and I consider myself we because I think I'm still part of it, even if I have my paperwork through something else, because legalization hasn't happened. And we have a second class, we have a group of people who are economically and legally um, don't have the same rights. Um, and we're also not allowed to vote. Um, and the longer that we don't vote, um, they're afraid. I feel like people are afraid to hear how we're going to vote. And I look forward to the day when I get to vote. <laughs> so now we're gonna transition to a sort of similarly public project. Um, Nathaniel, and I have to apologize, Donna, am I saying that right? Nathaniel, please correct me. Oh uh, yeah, it's okay. Nathaniel Donna, Donna? Yeah. Yes, that's correct. I'm really bad at pronunciations. Just like that's okay. Obviously. I'm bad at names, so. Uh, this is Nathaniel's project, Acknowledgement of Historic Polyrhythm of Beings. Um, it was a public art installation and activation commissioned by the Contemporary Arts Museum Houston. And it's more than 120 feet across uh, construction fencing that surrounded the museum's front lawn during its campaign renovations. Um, it was initiated through a backpack exchange with the youth of Houston's third, fourth, and fifth wards. And it's sort of text and object-based object that acknowledges and reflects the importance of history, education, family, and visibility in these communities and in Black American social life. Um, Nathaniel, I know you organized with 
the Shape Community Center, Change Happens, Jack Yates High School, Cashmere Gardens Elementary. How did this project work for the students who came and exchanged backpacks as part of the project? Well, it, you know, it, 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 had a, uh, it had a double type of meaning because I wasn't initially, I've always thought of, I'm always interested in collaborations and been doing different types of exchanges. But uh, considering COVID, they added another layer to it. And that layer is that I think because of, um, I'll get to the kids, but because of, uh, in terms of the parenting, because of like people were not able to work or lost their jobs because of COVID, um, I thought that this, this particular exchange would be um, like an added bonus because of that loss. And although I was thinking about education in terms of school, there's also the idea of education in terms of just being um, wherever you are, whatever space you're taking up at the time. So the education doesn't stop within the four walls of an institution is how I see it. So um, for, for the students, um, it, was, it was more of a idea of being able to participate in something that did, wasn't necessarily impacted by COVID in the way where you, know, you have to remain in a secluded space, home or wherever, or you were in out, you know, just wasn't able to get out. And um, it's also a thing where um, the kids' voices were heard, but it wasn't in terms of the vocal, but it was in terms of the visual and the participatory. And that just kind of reminded me of the times where I grew up, where I grew up and when I was growing up that I didn't have any idea what a museum was, right? And so for me, all the space is a studio space. All the space is a museum space or what have you. And so when I heard back from some of the students and some of the parents and also the community organizers over those spaces, they were telling me how much they, the kids really enjoy being a part of that and seeing themselves in, in the space. Now, I'm not sure if they under, you know, know about you know, the kind of uh, levels of class or hierarchy or issues regarding the institutions, relationships with communities like the ones that I'm uh, engaging here, but they can say, you know, well, this is something that I collaborated with the artists because it's not a sole project for me. And um, when, I get, when, I, when I get back home, you know, that opens up the doors for more projects. Or even now I found out that the CAM, the, all of the groups that I work working with now have relationships with the CAM and they're doing projects. So I, I think I see that as a nice way of kind of bridging, you know, some, some, some issues. Like relationships that didn't exist before you were kind of. Nah, not, not, not in this way, yeah. not in this way. And uh, cause this, cause, cause my thing was I didn't, that's why I, I don't know if I had an image, but that's why I wanted to not only do the exchange because we did the exchange and it was hot too. We did the exchange behind the cam. Yeah, but we also did the exchange in the community center too, right? So it was important for me to actually be in the space because I, otherwise I felt slightly hypocritical by just being at the cam and not engaging in the space with the people that I'm trying to engage with, you know? So yeah, it was, it was, uh, it was a pretty good experience. Um, I think just, just in terms of reiterating uh, the importance of exchange and the importance of reuse, you know, and, and resourcefulness. Uh, I think that came over well without having to be didactic or preachy about that. So another type of, I guess, pedagogy coming through with another angle, you know. What about this kind of engagement with community going into the community centers is essential to your practice as a visual creator, as an artist? <laughs> the simple answer, answer is that's where the action is, right? That's, that's where it is. That I think art 
as a subgenre of aesthetics or life through, through a westernized lens, right? It's been removed from life. In, in different cultures, there's no necessarily word for art, right? And so this is just about living, right? And so for me, there's a, like a, a type of uh, reclaiming of that idea by being in the space and identifying all of these different types of things that's happening in these, in these communities. And it's not where some people come in these communities and try to tell the community what art is. Well, no, it's not that. It's, 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 I'm, I'm coexisting with the community. In fact, I'm, even though I come from the, these places, I, I'm, I'm originally from Third War. And my family, the, the, the ties into this um, project in terms of family is that all of my family come from one of those different spots. And it's their historical black neighborhoods in Houston. So outside of that, it's, it's, not, it's me learning and, and keeping in tempo with uh, what's going on in this community and what's going on with my understanding and um, love for a certain type of aesthetic that gets overlooked or gets uh, uh, erased or uh, marginalized, you know, or weakened. And so I think going back and, and me having some, one foot at least in the art world, <laughs> one foot, it, 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 it connects, makes a connection. And it also, I don't wanna say I'm trying to critique the institutions, but that may come out of it as well. But in the same sense, not to look at the communities in a um, romantic way. There's a critique with the community as well. Because I'm from there, so I'm able to you know, show love and then show truth or disagreement. I don't know if I, don't know if I answered your question, but. You absolutely did. OK. Maria, how do you, how are you responding to what Nathaniel's saying? How is this kind of engagement with the public elemental to your uh in a similar way? Well, I think um, I agree with Nathaniel. I feel like um, sometimes we make artwork or whatever we call art or art practice for the conception of public spaces or galleries or collectors. And uh, um, there's, there's a separation there. And um, I find that same sense uh, connecting with my hometown, connecting with the people. And sometimes our perception of the role of art or the ideas themselves is very different from what we talk about in school because then we're talking with, we're dealing with actual community and everyone has lots of ideas and experiences and it's um, we have to be open um, so when I'm making like public murals or I'm conducting workshops uh, where we're having conversations about what it means to belong and what it means um, to to be part of the making I feel like that autonomy of making art has been somewhat removed, right? This idea that we have to go to school and go through it and pay all this money and do all these things. But the art is, as Nathaniel said, part of being a person or part of being human or, you know, everyone makes even um, the natural world, the ecological world is always making something. So we're all artists and it doesn't have to be um, just in the commercial art world, but, right, Nathaniel? And produce right. for that purpose. Right, yeah. I agree. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I, that's the thing. I think the, the I think you made a good point about like the human humanness, uh, humanity, uh, uh, human being. And part of that is being right and being or becoming or been like all of these tenses is about like time and how we <clears throat> work through time and working through time is always engaged with it in the, the sense of imagining uh, what we can, how we can see tomorrow, right? Or what the possibilities may be, or how do we look back? <clears throat> excuse me. How do we look back and consider like <clears throat> ways to like even better that circumstance in our present time, you know, or, or preserve, you know, what we had and not lose that is important. Thanks. Exactly. And often because, I mean, as a person from my background, um, we, our belonging gets erased. We become invisible. So I feel like we, we bring those conversations and not for the consumption of um, some sort of audience, but for ourselves and for the community. 
Um, so I agree with Natalia completely. You know, I think that there are multiple ways of being an artist in the world beyond just school or gallery or museum. Maria, would you mind telling us a little bit about this image that we're looking at now with the uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg kind of collaborative uh, installation? <laughs> Yeah, so this is uh, a moment for we, we Make America where we, um, we did a, a mural on the exterior of the wall during the, the time a lot of art was going up uh, all over the cities, all across country. And this was our response and it was before she died. Um, so, you know, it was, it was right before. And in a way it kind of, just, it seemed timely and we painted it together and everyone helped design and, um, and then it got covered up by another graffiti artist. <laughs> Um, I think I think that's what happened to it. I think we got tagged right on top, and then um, it was temporary. It was just uh, an expression. I think many people were voicing their ideas um, on the exterior of buildings. You make a lot of different work in the public space, and I think it's really interesting how even the the work you create that's very large scale, as murals, it can exist still within these kind of public interior spaces. So I know you've created work in like health centers and libraries that and galleries, places like this mural you know, that's going up at the Fine Arts Center at Colorado College, um, where it's accessible to, you know, the public, but it's kind of behind these doors that both protect it, but also kind of create a form of separation. Yeah, and um, the previous work with We Make America, that's a collaborative project. So everyone kind of had a conversation and the idea was evolved. And, you know, I like my part of it was like help to paint. Um, in the example here at the Colorado Fine Arts Center, uh, Colorado College, um, um, Pauline Nordstrand uh, invited me to be part of the exhibition. And basically over a Thanksgiving break, um, kind of four days, I was able to construct this installation. Um, some of the components are painted directly on the wall with a giant brush and then others are selections from a giant collection of drawings that I've been making uh, forever it seems and then um, with the team and students we decided people were able to pick the drawings that they wanted to put up and find locations with them so I didn't arrange everything it was a that was the collaborative part was the arrangement um, although I did create some of the content or all of the content, but I think of it as like a puzzle, like a non-linear kind of um, mural, a mixed media mural. And, um, and I like particularly about this instance was that I, I didn't get to tell people where I, every, every time you paint, like I make a painting, I decide where everything goes. And for me, it was uh, surprising and also part of the fun to see where things were placed and why and what kind of context they made against the kind of image in the background. And as I move forward, I want to do more, not just where you take um, the communities or communities and you have conversations about what we want, what we want to put in for the future and think about future ideas of, of how we are, how we want to be represented and what we want to um, remember, but also have them be part of it. So I envision one day doing a very large installation where all of the components are not created by me and by my sense of a lens, right? Because we all have a lens, we all have a perception. Um, so that's that's part that's in the cards. And I draw like I draw very differently. So every drawing has a different kind of style, almost like there's just like different techniques. So people already think that the works are done not necessarily just by me. Sometimes people will walk into the installation and think that it was by, by several people. Um, so I am I'm hoping to play with that in future shows. And how does that kind of collaborative process transition when you are kind of presenting something more formally to the community, like in this piece that you made for Pratt's campus in Manhattan? Well, this piece uh, I was invited um, because I went to Pratt for undergrad to do this temporary installation. And it was really fun because um, I had to add, I was painting from the inside out and I had to add components. So the, the actual under layer is the first layer you see from the outside. And part of the, the goal here was to let some of the light come through and that um, cover the glass completely so that it changed through the day. Um, so it always sort of transforming. 
and uh, it took me over about seven days to paint it. And people would come through and photograph and document and ask questions. Um, I really like that experience of painting this in the public eye um, because it, it was almost performative. Um, and, and it was like little chill, like everyone was just sort of part of it. And, um, and so that was lovely. And it was temporary, the, the piece has been destroyed. Um, so after the remodeling of the gallery was done, the, the, the glass windows were destroyed. I really like the idea of these kind of like formal commissioned pieces versus the work that Nathaniel often does, kind of more guerrilla style in the public space. So these are two works, um, one from 2017, one from 2015 by Nathaniel. And I've been wanting to ask you this question for a while, Nathaniel. Um, so you describe the billboard on the right as kind of like a formally commissioned project by the Houston Arts Alliance, but the billboard on the left is reclaimed signage. Um, how do these processes, how did the process for creating these works differ and sort of what was, what was the result of them? How long did they last? Um... The one on the right was like, there was like the citywide um, thing that uh, was going on um, um, during, I think there were like down, out, Houston's downtown is, is trying to always trying to like morph into this like major hub where everybody from the city comes, <clears throat> excuse me, but they have problems <clears throat> excuse me, because Houston is so large, right? And you can literally live on one side of town or the city and never have to go. You can live on the south side. And there are people who live on the south side never go to the north side, ever. It's like saying, I've never been to Colorado. And so they're always trying to get people to like, uh, you know, galvanize in the, in the center. And so uh, I was just chose, you know, I, I was selected to do this piece and it, it went through more of the, like the formal kind of uh, uh, ways of being selected, you know, showing these images and whatnot. And it's, it's more directly or connected with the city at large. Uh, and it's basically just uh, one of um, the drawings, like drawings I would do, drawing slash paintings. Uh, overlaying uh, a, a photograph. And the photograph is from um, Third Ward. <laughs> I might talk a lot about Third Ward. So it's, the photograph is from that area, you know? And so it's kind of like looking to that area. The, the left image is, is in, uh, was commissioned by Project Row Houses. And the um, which is in Third Ward, and if you're not, if anyone is not familiar with Project Row Houses, it's basically like um, uh, um, a, a, a art space that was uh, row houses that were transformed into an art space and also a space to help mothers, single mothers. So there's this um, function uh, with the community along with art, and that came out of uh, a lot of uh, like, like five artists, one being Rick Lowe, uh, who people probably know more, but there are other artists who done that. And that idea came from John Biggers who discovered the Texas Southern University Art Department. And this is all within the third war uh, area. And so what makes this different is because there is a, a specific connection to this community, right? The space that I'm using, uh, the space that's on the right is like made, you know, we're going to create these uh, poles and just move through downtown. But the space on the left is directly connected to a food restaurant, a fish fry food restaurant that everyone's familiar with in this area. And th there was a sign there, you know, there was their sign, their, their food restaurant sign. So I kind of, kind of, uh, transform that sign, right, from what it was to what it is now. And the photograph is from within the sign, I mean, from within the restaurant. So it's kind of meta, 
But the interesting thing is that across the street at an angle, there's the park called Emancipation Park. And Emancipation Park was developed by some ministers, one being Jack Yates, which is the high school I went to, which is also the high school George Floyd went to. Um, may he rest in peace. Um, that Emancipation Park, that was the first park that, was, that allowed Black people to publicly gather in that space. So it's historically important. And so they were renovating the park, right? And so I wanted to have the, the couple, you know, kind of pointing to that. And so like there's this kind of portal created and I'm thinking about like the space as it is, but like what it used to be and like what they're looking at is as it's being developed. So there's this kind of three layered thing of time, you know, that I'm looking at. So that's, that's what makes that different from the right and probably a little more interesting. Yeah. I love that like layering of time and this sign being from the restaurant that that photo was taken in and just like all of the kind of historical richness that you, you know. Saw. Yeah, it, it becomes a material, you know, it becomes a resource, you know, you know. I'm I'm sorry. Sorry. I'm oh, sorry. No. Yeah. Let me let me mute myself. Okay. <laughs> no, don't mute yourself because I have more questions. <laughs> okay, I'll try to I'll try not to go. You know what I mean? Like deep to yeah. like, uh, <laughs> So this is in New Haven. It is not. That's uh, that's in Houston. But yeah. it's part of the the earlier project. The other the first piece that you showed. Yeah. Um, and by the way, I just wanted to say because I didn't have video, I should have been smart like Maria that those, those, those backpacks lit up in Morse code. And the Morse code was a chant from John Coltrane's Love Supreme, an essay, Uses of the Blues by James Baldwin, and uh, of the first verse in Solange's song, Mad. And so I'm creating this song through Morse code with, with, with light. So I just wanna to, want to recognize that point. But um, this, this, this particular project is titled Acknowledgement the historical polyrhythms of being. And in that piece, I'm trying to propose a uh, argument that are, are support the argument through the making and doing of all of these things that you know art is like, right? It's a very simple concept, but I'm trying to, instead of arguing a point through a mathematical equation, or uh, argue the point through a uh, uh, oral argument, or philosophical argument, verbally or written, how can you do that with the work? So, so there are many layers of the project because there's like many facets of life, right? For a human being, such as Maria was speaking of earth. So th this part is the public art part. And the, the, um, there are parts like there is a painting component, there's a pop public art component, there's a, uh, there's a, a, a video component. And uh, at, this, at the end, there'll be like a summation of all of those things in one book. And so what this is doing is um, looking at the intervention or, or if it's not an intervention, you would call it like an interruption, right? And um, taking these things and then there will become, this, this image will become like a meme, right? So it'll live in a different format but it still be all connected to the entirety of the piece. So this was a, used to be a club, a blues club in Third Ward. And uh, trying to looking at the history of the piece, other space, you know, and then uh, thinking about, I use like different materials. So I'm using a screw string, old guitar, and then there's a kente cloth pattern on the back of it. And uh, trying to, again, thinking about time, thinking about like trans transitioning or transatlantic slave trade into, from, be, from being African into becoming Black American, that whole transition period, and what that means, and how does that work musically, and how does that work musically is like through Negro spirituals, gospel music, blues, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So that's kind of what this kind of thing is representing. It serves as a really powerful monument to this place that doesn't exist anymore, but does, you know, like well, the people are there. It also references a blues uh, singer named Lightning Hopkins. And he had a song on, on Dowling Street, which this street used to be called Dowling. 
but now it's called emancipation after the park. So they, cause Dick Dowling was like a uh, slave owner, you know? And so, uh, and that change of the name of the street was done by that community and other people. So it was like a hands-on thing, you know, to change the name of the street. So I was also thinking about that kind of activism and claiming of a space. And Nathaniel, I wanted to add to that, that I love the, um, the kind of link that you're linking not just time, but conversations um, and in Thank sort of movement forward for, for change and, you know, altering the space to, to create change or to, to memorize, to, to, you know, bring forth not just the conversation that we want to reinforce as an artist at this time, but that there is a link. Thank you. I really love this piece. Wow. Oh yeah, this this is the piece you get in trouble for maybe. And it's really simple. Uh, if anyone remembers um, uh, Do the Right Thing, Spike Lee uh, film where uh, uh, Mookie was, I think it was Mookie. Well, it couldn't have been Mookie, it could have been the other guy uh, who was talking about the sneakers. And he was in the restaurant, the Italian restaurant, and there were no black people on the wall, Sal. So that, brought to mind how there were no black artists on this artist on this you know sculpture which you know I, I i love a lot of these artists right but there still were no black artists on it so i you know i took it upon myself to to you know collaborate with whoever made this and you know the, the collaboration may not have been you know one in one but you know thought, hey you know whoever made this you know they they can understand you know you know so yeah <laughs> Um, moving towards your, like, keeping in this same line of, like, interventional, technically maybe not allowed installation, um, what is it like when you go out and make, like, and are creating work like this in the public space? Like, how do you feel when you're kind of just, like, out there as a person, just, like, and people are like, what is, what is this guy doing, you know? It, yeah, I, I have a lot of feelings. <laughs> Uh, sometimes I'm nervous, you know, because yeah. uh, I never know, you know, you know, being, be, you know, you, I, I can already be perceived a certain way, you know, right, and then just physically, you know, and like all the stereotypes that are, are applied to black males, right? Uh, then if I'm not uh, like in New Haven, like the one on the left is in New Haven. So if I'm, if I'm, if no one knows you, you know, then now you're a stranger. And what exactly are you doing here, you know? And me coming from a particular neighborhood that I come from, strangers are really uh, under the microscope. So you can be under surveillance by the state, or you can be under surveillance by the state of the neighborhood. And so I have to try to, you know, make myself visible sometimes, just like, just ordinary, just, hey, I'm just around, you know, whatever. And uh, it was kind of difficult in, uh, New Haven because I'm not, you know, the snow and all that kind of stuff, the, all the, you know, those things, I had to adjust to those things first. So I get, I get a little nervous sometimes. And then sometimes I'm really proud of, of it because in some sense, people may see this who are watching, y'all may think, oh, okay, well, this is like an intervention or this is like him making a claim or stake. But I, I see it, I, again, going back to what Maria's saying, I, I see it as a collaboration but I see it as more of an um, a, a offering back to a community that gave me more, or not more, gave me um, this idea or this sense of who I am, even on an aesthetic level, before I became associated with you know, art or whatever that is. So I'm also creating like more of a, uh, almost a ritual kind of uh, relationship to the community when I do these things. That's the way I see it. Maria, are there any kind of, oh. Uh, do you mean that if I, if I do also on yeah, non-permit, like not more like role in collaboration with this community? Well, um, because of my legal status, um, not necessarily, you know, I feel like some people can not be perceived. I feel like it has to do also with like society. Like some people get away with just, they can be doing a half a building and nobody's going to look at them, but I think it depends on who you are. And I think that's Natalia's point that um, there's a risk 
And for me, I've always wanted to. I, I take photos of walls because I love how they get painted over. And I'm like, oh, I, I want to do that. I have a note that I want to leave here. But um, I also, my lawyer um, doesn't <laughs> advise it. <laughs> I mean, think about that. There's like an article, oh, undocumented artist gets caught graffiti in the wall. And, you know, I have to get permission always um, yeah. from, for my actions. <laughs> Daniel, when you, you make you something know, like this, oh. oh, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I was gonna say real quickly, Maria, that was one of my points um, in, for um, the writing portion of the, of the uh, getting here in Yale was that I felt like, you know, like, the I, thinking of idea of building and think about capital and ownership of a building, like what that could represent in terms of business, you no know, business and corporate model, and then someone painting over it, right? Like painting on it or painting over it creates this like dialogue of saying, yeah, I'm here, I'm present. And in painting that even that conversation becomes like a form of painting that is outside of the institution that speaks to that social issue, you know? So, yeah. No, I totally agree with you. Yeah. And it's just very public. I feel like um, it's the, one of the most public um, acts and it just, it gets, keep getting cover ups. So it's it's non-monetary, -monet like it's just about something else. So I loved your pieces, Nathaniel. Thank you. When you make work like this that we're looking at now, do you leave it behind is yep. it yep so i leave it a gesture and, and it, yeah it's a gesture and like if any, you know this is the first one i've done with the gold chains fake 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 gold chains so like yeah somebody could come tag it if they want they come take it the chain if they want use it as a you know i don't know whatever you know uh, uh whatever they want to do with it because that's part of the point you know what's going on in the neighborhood or at that moment or whatever is what's going on with it so once it's there it's part of that so I'm, i have no you know ties to like trying to be pristine or precious about that thing but i do want to say that real quick that the building is the new haven armory and from my understanding that they use they had um what do you call those people uh national guards right so the National Guards in the 60s were here and they were using this armory to mine like the Black Panthers protests over the uh, trial in, in, in New Haven. So um, that was interesting to put it in this space because of that. And then the, uh, if, you, if, if anybody's not a hip hop head, that's an old group from the 80s and 90s is um, uh, Public Enemy. And the album is called Shut It, Shut Them Down, right? That's that song on this particular piece. And after that, in the 70s, the armory became um, like a, uh, a, a space for black cultural action, like NAACP and all these things. Not, you know, I don't know these things, I just found them out. And so I think it's interesting in terms of like transformation and, 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 and reclaiming a, a, a thing that was used against you to better uh, push forward your belief system or ide ideology or something like that. And I think like, what do you mean by shut them down? Who got shut down, right? The Black Panthers got shut down, the army gets shut down, the, the belief system or the particular systems of blackness gets shut down, but then it gets reanimated, right? And then other things, you know, this is going on. Anyway, yeah. Have you, have you tracked like what happens? Like go back and see if it's still there, if anything got transformed? Yeah, that one's pretty recent. So I haven't had, had a chance to get there because, you know, I had to rent a, rent a vehicle to get into that out a little bit further out. So um, no, not, not these pieces, but the, 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 the piece that we saw earlier that had the duct tape around the graffiti, just to know, I didn't do the graffiti. I just highlighted, highlighted it with the duct tape, which is another material I use, right? So I'm in conversation with the graffiti artist. And so, that building is no longer there at all, completely gone. It's like a lot, empty lot, so. So I know we're almost out of time. Oh, go ahead, yes. But I wanted to 
get to a little bit of Maria's kind of more wearable performative works. Um, had a lot more that I was hoping to be able to ask you all about, but I love this piece, Nathaniel, with the, the foreclosed clubhouse um, in 2009. I pulled it from your website. Um, kind of going back and forth between the, the engagement of various peoples, like not having it just be one person that's creating all this stuff, but having it be a process and thus never finished in a way. Um, and this project, I knew you had worked with Project Row Houses because of this project, but I didn't realize that the, the billboard project was part of that too. Um, but just like constantly having a practice that is about expanding the practice of others, essentially. Um, but before we close, I just want to ask both of you, um, how, who do we raise our voices for? How can art as both object and concept move beyond this like kind of trope of being like a method of resistance to catalyze like real felt change in our communities? Do you think it's possible? Is that art's role? Is it just a space of you know healing and kind of self-preservation? Or is there a way that art can kind of propel and by like leaving things behind and making these gestures like you do Nathaniel and by engaging all these various communities like Maria does. What's the effect of that? Is there a way that it can coalesce into something that changes things? Do you want to answer that big question first Nathaniel and then I will go second? It's very good. <laughs> no, I, I think I took up much too much air space. Please go first. Okay, well, um, I wanted to add that some of my most exciting work, I would say for me, are the multimedia wall murals. And then I also really love the performative aspects where I invite people to, um, and sometimes they even help me like transform the garments, but to be part of it and to talk about what gets to be on the bodies and think about language and symbolism and stereotype and also things that we love um, to be portrayed on, this, on their bodies. I feel like we, um, there's a certain physicality that I really like and that is different from when I wear my own work because in there I'm almost uh, pushing forward an idea of what I see myself like or what other people might see me as, right? Um, in those garments. Um, but in the ones where I get to be with people, it's about them. And, and we get to have a conversation about the imagery and the power of the imagery or the power of whatever is on the garments. Um, so I hope to move forward as well to do more of those collaborative pieces, not just where people wear them and, and perform in them, but also where I get to make the work with communities. Um, because we, we, I think clothing and, and wearable stuff and ritual have an overlap. And for me, it's a kind of fruitful place to talk about identity. And my favorite people to talk about identity with are teenagers um, and young kids. Um, because they have a certain perception. Um, and I think the one thing that we can think about art is that if we think about whether our life, our entire life and all of our actions are gonna have a submission, like add up to, to something, then it seems impossible. But I feel like if we think about how in this one specific action, you know, we are gonna have a relationship, a true relationship with people, and that experience will forever be part of them and part of us, then I think art does have the power to make change. And then I'm gonna follow that, let Nathaniel speak. Oh, I, I agree with it, all, of the, all of those points. I think the only difference is that um, I'm, I'm not using the garment as a, a mold to you know, engage with the public or the participant or the audience, but, um, and I would just say, if you was just to substitute um, just space, right? And the engagement with space uh, or whatever is in the space um, would be pretty similar, you know? And um, yeah, I, I, think, I, think, I think you're right about the team teams, you know, this is an interesting bunch, you know? And I think, um, even just the teen, an idea of a teenager, that idea of transitioning between like having no, having very little agency until 
starting to realize what your agency is about is an interesting point. And I think transformation is, uh, yeah. So I, I agree with all that. I just would substitute where we are with it, but. Yeah, and I think that the, it's so beautiful the way that that you um, collaborate with people and, and they're part of the making, not from this institution, like I am going to bring forth people and do a workshop and do this, but um, born from life, um, from our relationship to, to people and to space. Um, so I, I, if I would love to, I, obviously we get to talk beyond this panel conversation, but I, I really, I think that your work engages people, but it also engages architecture and, and yeah. who gets to own the, the architectural spaces, you know? Right, right, right. And taking ownership of, of land, which is one of those bigger, bigger questions. Right, exactly, yeah. Where is this piece? Um, I, I may have sent you too many Houston pieces, I think. That's in Houston as well. Okay. But it's, the reason why I sent it is because it's a part of that larger project, you know? Yeah. But uh, yeah, um, I'm yeah. There may, you may see some things popping up somewhere. That's all I can say. May if you got to be there, you know. Thing is, you got to be part of that space or, or the route to that space. Otherwise, it's just you know you just don't get it. You, you just won't be able to experience it, and that's fine, you know. I'm gonna keep my eyes peeled around New Haven. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Next time. <laughs> some art interventions. Thank you guys both so much for sharing your practice, sharing your work. Um, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. And thank you, Nathaniel. Thank you, Lindsay, and everyone who's here. Thanks.